Welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we provide thought leadership for wholesale change agents like you. Because if you're on this call, you probably are a wholesale change agent. My name is Ian Heller. I'll be your co-host today, along with my business partner, the hero of wholesale, the doctor of distribution, Jonathan Bine, PhD. And today we have a special guest, another partner at Distribution Strategy Group. She is the wizard of inside sales, Debbie Paul. Jonathan, Debbie, how are you today? Great, Ian. Awesome. Thanks. Good, good to see you. We're heading towards the holidays. We've got a couple more of these left to wrap up the year. Um, and uh, it's been, a, it's been a, an interesting year, hasn't it? I mean, we probably should do our year in reflection at some point. <clears throat> Holy cow, uh, what a year um, in retrospect, huh? No kidding. Yeah, so, I, saw, I saw some cars like celebrate 2020. It's like, well, frankly, I prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just forget about it. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. it's funny, you know, all that optimism and excitement at the beginning of the year. Um, and there have been some bright spots, right? But I mean, when so many people die, you know, it's like, oh, my God, it's, it's just not a year any of us want to remember. But hopefully 21, 2021 will shape up to be better. But we do have a very interesting topic today. And uh, this is how distributors can finally succeed at cross-selling. You know, Jonathan, you and I had a call recently, we won't say with who or what company this person was with, with a branch manager who has a bunch of inside salespeople who really are primarily taking calls, right? And uh, she said, well, when they're not busy taking calls, they have a list of customers that haven't bought from us in a long time. And we asked them to make outbound calls to those accounts to try to get them to buy again. And we said, boy, I bet that doesn't work too well, does it? She said, no, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> and Debbie, how many times have you run into distributors who, who you know, their, their version of trying to optimize the selling capability of their inside sales force is to have them make outbound calls when they're not taking inbound calls. Do you run into yeah. that a lot? All the time. Yeah. And that's the big challenge is, you know, if I'm an inside sales rep, First of all, I probably don't have the best skill set to make outbound calls, depending on how I was hired, right? So that's pretty, pretty common. And then it's much easier to default to waiting for an inbound call or cleaning up some inbound activity than it is to make an outbound call. So it just never, I've never seen it work. Frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't either. I've seen it tried over and over again. And I've sat on calls where your customer service people are trying to make outbound calls. It's just awkward, right? I mean, the customer's mm -hmm. not expecting it. You can tell that the person doesn't really have this, the talent to make those outbound calls. They may be fantastic in a customer service role, but there are other ways of getting value out of those people and, and, and teaching them to sell, which is really what this session is about. I do want to encourage all of our listeners. We have a good audience today. Please feel free to hit the Q and a uh, button or the chat button and send us questions. We'll try to get to all of them. As we go, we usually have a good, healthy dialogue with our audience. So we uh, hope that happens again today, but uh, let's jump into the deck. We only have a couple of slides today. Uh, really just one, I think, but this, so to our podcast listeners, uh, this slide is about giving a definition of what cross-selling is and then explaining why it's hard and what are some tools that can be helpful. So the definition of cross-selling, why it's hard and uh, how it can be helpful. So Debbie, you want to walk us through your definition of cross-selling? Sure. So when, when we talk about cross-selling, I like to think about it as selling across additional product categories. So, you know, a simple example of this could be, you know, maybe I'm, I'm a company a distributor and I'm selling soldering iron. Customer calls me up, says, hey, I want to buy a soldering iron. Well, what goes with that? In order to use a soldering iron, as you know, Ian, with your background, um, you know, you need to have tips, you got to have solder, you got to have flux, right? There's things that go along with that product that, you know, you have to purchase. Um, so you may say, well, that sounds like it's all kind of in one category, which it could be, right? It could be in the solder category. Um, but then the next question is, well, what are you using it for, right? And so that then can start the discussion to have more of a cross-sell conversation because maybe you find out they're doing small printed circuit boards. So they need components, they need the board. You know, who knows where the conversation can go? So. Cross-sell by definition is really crossing a sell across categories, but can it can also be selling deeper into a category as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, the reality is that mm -hmm. this is a much more palatable way for people who are wired for customer service to sell because you really are clearly helping the customer. And, and I mean, if you sell a customer a Sawzall and you let them walk out without asking them if they need blades, that's customer disservice, right? And, and customers almost never mind asking about things that they might logically want. And so it puts that customer service person back in a comfortable position where they're truly on a mission of service and they're not just trying to sell people. Exactly. You know, one of the other things about uh, cross-sell in terms of definition, sometimes upsell gets kind of a part of that particular definition. And upselling as we're defining it is simply selling more of the same product. So a lot of distributors have tiered pricing. You know, I know you guys did it, Granger, we did it newer. And so that's where you're just telling the customer, hey, if you buy more than a couple or even if you buy two to three, you can get a little bit of a discount versus just buying one. So upsell oftentimes is kind of couched along with the cross-sell definition as well. Yeah, and which is easier, do you think, for a customer service rep to get started with? definitely doing the upsell right because okay. again to your point you know it's kind of almost a service hey i can help my customer save a little money here if i let them know that they buy two or more and i can save you know 10 bucks or whatever so it's it's more of a service type sell i think than than necessarily you know asking the probing questions and really trying to dig in and find out what's going on so absolutely yeah. that's the yeah. place to start so I've told this story before, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it was on the show, but when I was a Granger branch manager, I had this guy in a branch named Bill who was just this phenomenal upseller, cross-seller. He just loved doing it. It was really fun for him. And somebody called up one day and ordered a $1,500 commercial water heater. And Bill asked what no one else probably would have thought to ask, which is, hey, if you buy three, they're 1250 or whatever the price was. And the guy said, okay, I'll take three. And so Bill, going for broke, said, if you buy six, they're 1180 or whatever. And the guy goes, okay, I'll take six. Well, the guy didn't know that we had tiered pricing and he had never bought a water heater from us before because we were expensive if you look just at the catalog price. Well, once he bought six at one shot, of course, we sent a sales rep out to talk to this person and he became a major account because he had never really thought about Granger. He never really categorized us as a water heater supplier, which gets back down to a point we'll talk about later, Jonathan, you know, about customers segmenting their distributors. Um, and that was a way of taking an upsell and turning it into a big account because you are redefining the customer's impression of who you are and what you sell by suggesting things that they might logically need just as a part of that one transaction. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I see when I create these inside sales or proactive inside sales capability for our clients is customers have no idea even what the breadth or depth of product is that most distributors carry. You know, they, they just don't know. And so, um, you know, right. it's not, it's not for, it's not because they're not buying it from you. They may not know you have it. Yeah, and actually, uh, one of our listeners, Eric, who's a good friend of the show, said another tool to help merchandising. So impulse item placement, category signage, promotions, et cetera. So this is the merchandising that happens in the showroom. And we know from our own experience that some distributors are great at that, others are not. But I think the mistake is to measure that just by the walk-in sales of impulse items. I mean, you want to know that, but you're actually redefining who you are and what you sell as a distributor when you constantly put images of your products and your brands out in front of them. And it's one of the things that, you know, Granger did so well for so many years was we opened the catalog and literally in the showrooms, you could see everything we had to sell and we had flyers and you could see everything we had to sell. And you constantly have to remind customers of your assortment. I mean, I think one of the working assumptions you have to have when you're in sales and marketing for a distributor is your customers do not know what you sell. And in every opportunity, every interaction, you have got to redefine that and expand that. And that's why things like cross-selling are so important because to your point about solder, the customer may only come to you for those soldering items because he or she found you for that item at one point in time really never considered you for trash pumps or for bearings or for motor starters because they don't associate you with that product. And this cross selling and upselling and, and just creating that dialogue on the phone is a great way to describe more products that you have for the customer that they don't know that you carry, right? So, so for both upselling and cross selling, anything that increases the average order size, which means more gross profit dollars in the order is goodness because 
Um, we see this all the time when we look at customer, our distributor customer data, we see that they have customers who are generating $50 gross profit per order. We know that customer is losing money for the distributor. So anything that's gonna increase the average order size and create more gross profit dollars in the order is good news. My, my, um, when I think about the upselling, it seems like it's really key to get the, the tiering price right. Um, you know, we've, we've all seen situations, and in fact, this is probably the norm, where pricing is pushed to the customer service rep or to the sales rep. And um, to the extent that the customer service rep or sales rep is winging it on the pricing, uh, you, you may not get optimal balance in terms of motivating the customer to buy more and also making more money on the order. So I think that's a great point because, you know, if you talk to the guys that talk about uh, small order economics or lack of, e of economics, yeah. you know, so the waypoint or profit aisle, they talk a lot about trying to find ways of increasing the average order size. Some of those are much easier to execute than others. Some are more put obstacles in front of customers potentially, mm -hmm. but suggesting more items when people call in, it's a win-win, particularly if the customer needs that stuff, right? And it's really no different than when you go onto a website and they say, hey, customers who bought this also bought that. It's just a human version of that. And it works online and you appreciate it if you've forgotten something. And I think people appreciate it over the phone as well. We do have a couple of comments. So I, I'm probably going to pronounce this name wrong, but Sachin has uh, said, we offer packaged data analytics for distributors. Most of our clients give access to such analytics to executives and leadership only. Do you see a need for sales reps to have access to such analytics? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna talk about that later, but I think the, you know, knowing what people are likely to buy if they've bought, you know, one product, here's what they're likely to buy to go with it. That is an analytical exercise uh, that we'll discuss in a bit. But yeah, Sachin, I do think that's needed. Do you have any comment on providing those kinds of analytics to frontline inside sales people or sales reps team? Yeah, I mean, it, it's great if you have that information because, you know, as we're going to be talking about next, it's it's so hard as a rep, especially if you've got, you know, tens of thousands of products to try to remember, you know, what goes with what or what to talk about. Right. So any kind of analytics or information that's available to help with that would be huge. And then we have another comment. Uh, this is from Tim. Inside sales needs to, or ten, excuse me, inside sales tends to be a transactional focused role. Need to move them past product centric and project centric to truly customer centric. That's an interesting point. I don't think anyone would argue with it. How do you interpret that, uh, Jonathan, Debbie? Ma making a, how do you make an inside sales role customer centric, an inside sales person? I think that it's hard to do, and I think it's part of the skill set within that individual. Um, and I always kind of come back to, you know, one of the things I look for is curiosity, you know, in someone, you know, is to, is to really be curious about what is that customer doing? How are they using the products? You know, how can I help make their business better? So the customer does become sort of the center of everything. And you really need to try to reach out and understand, you know, how are they using your products? Um, and how can you help make things better, faster, easier, whatever? Otherwise, I don't think you can really be successful as a salesperson today. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say if you're not customer centric, you're not a salesperson, right? You're an order taker. Yeah. Um, yeah but I think part of the customer centricity that Tim alludes to is is really understanding the customer's business, which ties back, Debbie, to what you were saying about the curiosity um, and, and bringing understanding of the business, perhaps in general, prior to a sales call. Um, that's where the value add comes. And those are the salespeople that are gonna be in demand, that are, that are able to go beyond transactional to be able to go beyond uh, mere order taking. Yeah, I, I think the, the notion of the professional visitor, the order taker, I don't think people like that have ever been successful sales reps for distributors. I just think distributors are getting leaner and meaner and they're managing it more aggressively. And so there's less room for that kind of person to get by. Uh, we do have, this is a very interesting question. So Scott is asking, uh, I have actually had customers tell me to stop suggestive selling. How would you overcome that objection? 
So that's an interesting one. I have run into that, but before I go, uh, what do you guys think? I think that happens. Um, I think if you if you do it over and over and over and over again, and the customer's calling in frequently, and you're you're not using your head to say or have an analytic tool to help you, um, you know, understand when and how to do that, it's difficult to do, right? Um, so I don't know. I haven't heard that very often, to tell you the truth. So, so the context I heard it in was with a uh, it was with a large customer who was trying to limit the products being bought by their purchasing and maintenance people who were calling in orders, right? So they were saying, "Look, you know, I'm, uh, they are they're only authorized to buy certain things. Stop encouraging them to go outside the lines because we have an agreed upon set of SKUs mm-hmm. that we can buy from you." Uh, or we're trying to limit their, you know, their, the, the amount that they're buying. Um, and so I would say in that situation, it was really a hard problem 20 years ago because mm-hmm. you didn't have ERPs that would put customer notes up in front of you as you were taking the order. So I would say, you know, to Scott, if it's happening in that context, you just need to make sure you've documented which accounts those are. In the most extreme case, you might route those calls to customers who are or customer service reps who are specifically trained to handle that account so they don't suggestive sell. And I would say the other place where you would logically see it is like what Debbie said, where you have someone who's not doing it well. And, and but I would also say, look, you know, if you have one or two people say that out of thousands of customers, you can't change your whole strategy right. because it doesn't work for a customer or two. And, you know, you're never gonna get consistent requirements and needs and expectations from 100% of customers. Well, but another, I think another point of the cross-selling as well as the upselling is that the, it needs to happen across all the customer touch points. I mean, going back to Eric's point about making sure you're doing merchandising properly. So in, in face-to-face settings, there's cross-selling on the web. There has to be cross-selling. If you've got a DCD commerce solution, this is going to be one of the next things that a lot of distributors are, are implementing over the next couple of years, as well as on the phone uh, with a sales rep. So all of the customer touch points need to be enabled to do that cross-selling. Okay. And Eric has attributed uh, another point. He's saying, this is another listener, to drive selling-focused CSA culture and process, I guess CSA is their acronym for Inside Sales Customer Service Associate, four things need to happen. One, Hiring and hiring for the right skill set. Uh, two, training and coaching. Three, incentives for the customer service agents. And four, ongoing communications and dashboards. So, hiring the right skill set to begin with, doing the right training and coaching, having the proper incentives, and doing the measurements and communications and dashboards. That strikes me as a good solid list. Uh, Debbie, Jonathan, you guys have any reaction to that? No, it's absolutely right. Every single one of those things is absolutely correct. So talk about hiring to the right skill set because it's not everyone can upsell or cross sell, right? Yeah, you know, it's it's the conversation that we've had time and memorial really right. about, you know, can you expect a customer service rep who has a specific frame of mind, a specific type of being, can you expect them to then turn around and sell? So you, you want a customer service rep who's very empathetic, who wants to help the customer, who has you know good attention to detail, who really can dig in and solve a problem and do all those things to make the customer happy, right? That skill set is very different from the curiosity thing that I talked about, you know, of, of really wanting to understand and asking questions and being proactive to understand about that customer's business and them as, as an, even as an individual. But, but, so they're but, very different skill sets. But a lot more people can cross sell and upsell than can make outbound calls. Would you agree? Yeah, I think they can definitely upsell. I would agree. I, I still think cross selling is a challenge um, because of, and I think it's more of a mindset thing in terms of how a service rep views it. If you say sell to a to a CSR, you know that's a bad word, right? You don't <laughs> you don't want to say that. Um, so it, it, it's oftentimes it's even their perception of, you know, what you're asking them to do. If they think it's selling, then it's going to have more of a negative connotation in some cases. So we should call it, we, can, we need to come up with a different term than cross-selling. Cross-helping. Cross-helping. Yeah, that's a good one. 
<laughs> so we have three reasons here why cross-selling is hard. One is that reps don't know the products well enough. Uh, the second one is it's hard to get the right information to the reps. And third uh, is this interesting notion that you introduced me to, Jonathan, which is that customer segment or distributors. So do you want to go, with, who wants to start with uh, cross-selling is hard because reps don't know the products well enough? Let's defer to Debbie. Yeah, well, and, and this was always a challenge for me in distribution because, you know, when you've got tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of products, you know, it's hard to do at the SKU level. So what we would do is we would try to create these little, you know, cheat sheets at the category level to say, you know, if you buy this, you know, ask about this. Um, but still, it was difficult because the reps, they, you know, especially newer reps that aren't as familiar with the product. Um, it was just difficult to get them comfortable enough to even want to suggest, you know, a cross product. Um, and so that was always the biggest challenge for, for us. And then just even remembering to do it, you know, especially when you're in a fast paced environment, a lot of inside sales CSR situations are all reactive. You got to take that next call or handle that next email or text. And so it's difficult to even remember to do, you know, what you need to do. So, so Debbie, per perhaps a variant of reps don't know their products well enough. In the case of many distributors who have tens or hundreds of thousands, as you did at Newark, they can't know their products well enough. It's impossible. There, there's just too many products to know, right? Right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, look, I think the... The knowledge is really more about the underlying principles that operate the products than it is mm -hmm. about the number of SKUs, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, when I was at Granger, I kind of learned that, hey, if you understood electromechanical switches, you could understand motor starters mm -hmm. and contactors and relays and thermostats and a, a bunch of other things. You know, if you understood how cylinders worked, you could understand air compressors and air uh, refrigeration compressors and, you know, so, so and, and small engines, right? So I think to some degree, you need to be clever about how you do the training so that you're mm -hmm. teaching principles right. that allow you to understand categories rather than individual products. And, and you know, a lot of times you don't get that from suppliers because suppliers are telling you individual <laughs> products, right? So you kind of have to mm -hmm. do your own training design um, and I do think some of it's just time in the role because after a while you just sort of figure stuff out and, and you know how to get the answers to questions that maybe earlier in your career you wouldn't have had the knowledge base even know how to ask the right question about it. Um, but I do think it you're comes right. Down to the comfort level, Ian. Yeah. You know, right. and, and that's one of the things that I run across all the time is, you know, with newer reps, they're just not comfortable. Even though they may understand the principles, they're just not comfortable to really, because they always say to me, well, what if I suggest a product? And then they ask me questions about it and I don't right. know anything about it. Right. You know, so it comes down to a lot of that sort of confidence. Um, and how do I get to find out that, that product? You know, go on the website, look it up. So but, I think a lot of it's a confidence thing too. I agree, but it does lead to this next point, which is that cross something is hard because it's hard to get the right info to the reps. So no matter how well you know products, there's a limit to everyone's knowledge. And what you don't know is off the top of your head, what you actually sell that goes with that product and what's actually in stock that goes with that product, right? And those can be big determinants as to whether or not you can effectively cross sell. So what information do you wanna put in the hands of reps so that if somebody does buy an item, that they have an easy way to suggest a complimentary item? I mean, how do you gather that data? What do you put in front of the... I think it's really hard. It kind of starts sometimes with even the ERP system. And I see with some of the old systems, it's hard to even see what the description of the item is because the description could be, you know, like numbers. Yeah, right. It's 40, 40 hex yeah, characters, yeah, right? I'm in the yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so sometimes you can even look in the ERP system and see that I don't even know what that description means. Right. Um. So what we find is that oftentimes the description on the website is better, right? Because it has to be more descriptive. It has to be the information actually on the website tends to be better. You've got you know, images, you've got better information that you might get out of the ERP system. But um, it's still hard because you're not pushing that information to them. 
they still have to go out and they have to do their research and still kind of figure it out on their own because there's there's not a system telling them that, oh, you know, if this person bought a soldering iron, talk about solder, talk about flux. Right. And so I think that's the big challenge, you know, is is how do you do that? How do you do that? Yeah. Does this get back to the cross sell software that we talked about or that we're going to talk about in a minute? I think, I think so. Yeah. I, I, I mean, think look, I think there's, there's out there today. Yeah. I mean, I think manually you used to put notes in front of people or then, you know, there were computer notes in front of people. And I, I do think there's something to be said for just statistically people who bought this tended to buy that. And sometimes those are surprising and seem unrelated, but for some reason that we can't speculate about or can't figure out anyway, those items are related. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having that information is useful. It's just that sometimes it doesn't seem to make sense to the person who's trying to do this justice. Exactly. Thing. Exactly. Um, what, how do you feel about having promotions for people to pitch on every call? I think it's a good idea. In fact, we've actually seen um, some of our clients um, having great success actually with that. Um, it seems like sometimes with the promotional items, there's been a little bit more training around them sometimes. Maybe they're items that are a little bit easier to understand. Um, that are easier for the reps to talk about as a possibility. So um, I think it just depends. It depends on the promotion. It depends on, you know, incentives too. You know, sometimes there are incentives that go along with the different promotions, but um, no, I think it's I think it's fine to do. In fact, what we used to do because we had so many different products in so many different categories, we would actually have an item of the day Mm -hmm. you know, that we would, that we would sell. And it usually was like a safety item or something that was somewhat generic that we could talk about at the end of the call. And that was actually one of the ways that we helped the reps get comfortable with, you know, with doing this whole process. As so, well. uh, so I would That's say, kind of sorry, Debbie, I didn't interrupt. Not good. Um, I, I would say I have had more luck with category promotions just because there's a much broader chance of, somebody finding something a much bigger chance of somebody. So a tool, you know, we're having a power tool promotion generates interest and I can email a flyer to the customer or, you know, they can ask about, Oh, I was thinking about a Milwaukee half inch drill. Do you have that on sale? Whereas individual SKUs, even if it's a mix of 25 SKUs or whatever, it's a lot more hit or miss. I mean, it's kind of like they used to say back when we did catalogs, little books, little profits, because if you only had a hundred products in the in the catalog, there was very little chance that someone would find something that they wanted. But if you had a thousand, you had 10 times the chance, right? So I, I would say mm -hmm. I've had better luck giving people, you know, easy to describe categories. Hey, we're having a bearing sale. We're having a packaging product sale. Uh, we're having an electrical product sale. And you know, my my Granger background is showing because we had all those categories, right? And and it was just easier to describe that and then have a PDF that people could email out. How important is it mm -hmm. to have literature that customer reps can email to customers as part of that selling dialogue? It's super important. And I find that that's one of the areas that's really overlooked oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, when, when doing a promotion. Um, and I'm not sure why, you know, to me, it just seems like that would be a natural part of your campaign. But um, I find that our clients really just overlook it. They don't think about, you know, getting those tools to the rep so that they can use them and, and send them out. I, I think it's why. a lack. Why do you think I that think they're not, be? I think they're not paying attention to what the real point of contact is like between the customer and the company. I mean, I, you know, I feel distribution executives don't spend enough time sampling that interaction anyway, but if you're on the phone with a yeah. customer and you say, Hey, I've got to sell an X, Y, Z, I would say more than half the time they say, great, send me something about it. And mm -hmm. you need something to email and that's a valuable contact, right? Because you're continuing the dialogue, Absolutely. you're getting an email address you may not have, mm -hmm. you're responding to a customer's request in a way that's helpful for them. They're interested. It's a really high uh, open rate mm -hmm. because they've asked for it, you know? So right. I, I think it's, I think it's an important thing to have. Absolutely. Um, okay. Next. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, customers segmenting their distributors. So 
Jonathan, you introduced me to this idea. I think it's really interesting because we talk about segmenting our customers a lot in distribution and in marketing across all industries. But you've pointed out, I don't know if you made this up or you heard it somewhere else, but you said, well, yeah, be careful though, because customers segment their distributors too. Yeah, actually, we heard this from our former colleague, Jim Tanzilla, who was your colleague at Granger. Granger. Yeah, right. Yeah, and what, what Jim said is, you know, I, I get my fasteners from Debbie and I get my PPE from Ian and I get my tools from, from Jonathan. And that's how we think about the distributor. Truth of the matter is even small distributors have tens of thousands of SKUs often, right? Right. Uh, which means they have thousands of other SKUs that could be sold. So you have every distributor has got customers that buy daily or a couple times a week, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly, but they buy a very narrow, narrow set of SKUs. And that's, and that's the evidence of the segmentation. So anything you can do to shift customer's concept of what you sell is, is a win. Um, if, if, you know, if it starts out as this, this is how big their view of you is, through marketing, through sales, you can, you can shift their view of you to be larger and you can sell more. And when you sell more, you retain customers. It, it, it gets a lot stickier uh, once they're buying more product categories for you. You can run, you can run analytics, you, know, you can do regression on retention and number of product categories, and you're gonna find a really, really strong um, correlation between those two. So. Yeah, I remember uh, when, we, when we sold our house in Boulder, I needed to find some window closers, you know, after the inspection. And I, I, you know, I took apart this window, I looked up the part number and I, you know, special ordered the things and ordered some spares. Well, it turned out they were for sale in McGuckin's Hardware in downtown Boulder, which was like, you know, five minutes from my house at the time. And now that I live in a different town in Colorado, I find they're at my hardware store here too. I just never thought about hardware stores as a place to get window hardware, which mm -hmm. sounds dumb, but I didn't. I just didn't, I, I thought it would be a custom order item. And so I custom ordered it. And I think the reality is, like we said earlier, your customers do not know what you sell. And if you've ever walked through a branch or distribution center with a customer and talked about the product on the shelves, almost every time they will say something like, oh, I didn't know you carried X, Y, and Z, even though you've carried X, Y, and Z forever. They just don't know. And we have this assumption that customers come to us for, or that they think of us for lots of different products. And many customers think they come to you all the time because in their minds, they come to yeah. you every time you're a relevant supplier for them, right? Hey, I buy everything from you. Well, actually you buy your air compressor and air compressor products from us and that's it. And I can look around your shop and see a thousand other things you could buy from us, but you don't classify us as the supplier for that stuff. And that's, you, you know, customers- You buy everything we think, you buy everything you think we sell. That's correct, right? right. That's relevant to you. Mm -hmm. and, and this is super important because you've got to blow that up. This is about- blowing up the paradigm about what customers think you sell and about breaking out of the segment that they've put you in and moving into other segments too. And they're open to that. I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not like they, they don't want to talk to you about it. They just don't know. Right. You know, so it's a good yeah, conversation they, to have. And this is why, you know, when I, I do this presentation, the 10 commandments of distributor marketing, and, the, and I call the golden rule, the, the one I get to on the, in the 10th case is when in doubt, put relevant, put relevant offers in front of targeted customers, you know, on, a, on an ongoing basis, find offers that are that statistically like they'd be relevant to customers and put them in front of customers because educating them about what you sell is always a good thing. Um, Okay, so uh, Jason says, sounds like a good opportunity for AI, agreed. And Tim says, the fastest way to learn is to ask your customer good questions. If reps feel like they need to be the expert, they will neglect to learn the most efficient and fastest way. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so, right. So there are tools to help, right? So there's cross-sell software. Um, there's training that you can put in place and there's ERP data. Who wants to tackle these? Cross-sell software first? Yeah, let's start with that one. So we've actually um, been working with a company called Proton AI. And they're a young company. I think they've been around for, Jonathan, what, a couple of years now? Yeah, it started when Benj was still an undergrad. <laughs> okay. Um, what, anyway, what, 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 what were you doing at 21, Debbie? I know, right? <laughs> I was learning how to 
I barely remember. In the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so this software has been around for a couple of years, developed by a very bright young man. And it is incredible. It's AI based. And Jonathan, you know the, the more the details behind how it actually works, but it's AI based and it takes the data and over time it learns. And it's interesting to see this happening as we've um, we've installed this at, at a couple of our clients. And so now we're starting to see how it actually learns and works and morphs and changes. And it's really amazing. Do you want to talk a little bit more about how it works specifically? Sure. So um, the, the, the underlying technology in their case is using neural networks, which are, which are a form of learning based AI. There's a variety of different types of approaches for recommending uh, for recommender systems, which is what the broader category of cross health software is, right? I'm recommending you something that is a similar item. I'm recommending something that is a complementary item. Um, and it, it all comes down to the performance of these things. And the performance is measured in lift, sales lift per rep that's using it, or um, lift per, per customer that's using it in an online setting, what we've seen, and we've actually written some of this software ourselves, by the way, um, we've seen that th these AI techniques work very well. Um, and, and, and we're seeing significant lift across uh, sales reps and e-commerce sites that are using this. We're, we're on track with one customer we recommended for about 100,000 lift per rep per year. Is that the yeah, you know what, John, I checked a couple of weeks ago and they are doing amazingly. They're really closer to 200 to 250,000 a year. Wow, yeah. Per rep. yeah, it's it's amazing. Wow. Oh my god. Now this is a proactive inside sales team. So, you know, it's a little bit different. It's not a reactive group. Um, but it's it's just been phenomenal and it's just been a short time. So it's been amazing to see how it works. But, you know, I think the, the, the thing about this particular software that we're talking about, Proton, is it, it not only tells you a similar products and um, complementary products, but it also tells you what's due to reorder. Mm -hmm. So it has, it has the ERP data in the background so that the reps can go in and they can look at each one of these items and see when it was ordered last. And so the software is actually pushing that information to the reps so that they can just, you know, bring that up in their conversations. In this case, Proton actually even enables you to email, um, you know, if you, if you have a situation where you're not interacting with your customer, you can still email this information to them. But it's, it's amazing. And Ian, to your point, um, when working with this particular client, one of the salespeople she said, you know, I looked at what the recommendation was and the item that the system was recommending had nothing to do with what that customer typically purchased, completely different, entirely different. And so she said, I, you know what, I'm going to talk to the customer about this item. And so sh she did, not only did the customer end up buying that item, but she found out a whole bunch of information about another part of his business she didn't even know about. Yeah. So, and this is, you know, there are famous stories in the big data analytics world about stuff like this. And I, I don't remember the exact details, but there's something about how whenever a storm approaches, Walmart sells a lot more blueberry Gatorade or something like that. Some, some, some item that has no apparent connection is the number one correlated <laughs> item with bad weather, you know? So, and, and who knows right, what is behind that, but I think, you know, Using the data, if it's especially if it's AI generated and it gets smarter over time, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Now, Jason, another uh, regular listener, thank you, Jason, is saying thank you for calling out that AI is not a monolith. So this is pointed at you, Jonathan. I believe there are different. There are many different kinds with many different applications, and companies that talk about it as a panacea are the ones distributors should view with caution. Right. So, go ahead. I want to have another comment on this. Well, yeah, and I think I think w w whatever, first of all, you do need software and whatever software you need, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I mean, they, they can tell you about AI this, AI that. They can say, it's, well, it's symbolic AI, it's numeric AI, it's statistical analytics, it's whatever the technique is. But the proof of the pudding is when you put this in front of your 
reps, whether they're customer service reps, proactive inside sales reps, or you put it on your website, you run a trial. You have to run a trial with these things to see what kind of lift you're getting and to see how the reps are responding and to see how the end customers are responding. Are the reps using this thing? You know, and if I do an A-B test on this, uh, what kind of a, a lift am I getting for the test group versus the control group? Um, so it, 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 it all comes down to the test independent of the technology. So I listened to a podcast last night um, from Bain and company, the consulting company, and they have a website, bain.com slash loyalty. And so Frederick Reichheld, who wrote the great book on net promoter score and created the concept, heads up this practice or consults with them. And they were talking about how people adopt uh, technologies to get closer to their customers. And they, they made a couple of interesting points. One is that the early adopters tend to be more satisfied than the late adopters. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is they have stronger use cases, which is why they adopted it earlier, right? Mm -hmm. And secondly, nobody really knew if it was gonna work. It wasn't like this widely held thing that you should go adopt this. And so they worked really, really hard to make sure that it worked. And they said, look, these innovations are much harder to implement than you think. And then the third factor is the more players you have trying to sell these technologies, the grander the claims become as they try to win you over. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you look at CRM, right? Which has a very high failure rate. People spend a lot of money and they often don't get anything out of it. But if you read the claims from every CRM provider, you would think this would double your company, double your profits. It's really almost a panacea. And I'm not decrying the need for CRM platforms. I'm just saying that if you go into it thinking that I'm going to put this technology in and it's going to be a win, you're kidding yourself because you're going to have to really work hard at it and really treat it as a high level initiative uh, and if you don't do that, you're not going to get good results. And the same is true with any of these AI applications or this cross-selling software. You, you have to treat it seriously. You have to make it a major project. It's not going to be easy. It really needs to be sponsored from the top of the organization. And if you do those things, you'll probably have a lot of success. And if you don't, you will probably fail. I thought that was a really interesting part of that podcast. Um, and then let's talk about uh, training and uh, ERP data as tools that can help with cross-selling. Debbie, you've tried, trained a lot of these people. How do you train them to get better at this? Yeah, it's it's kind of, it's it's a struggle. Again, it comes down to the skill set. It comes down to who you're speaking with. You know, if you're, if you're working with CSRs, you have to come at it in a different way, as I said earlier. You know, maybe you don't use the S word to sell, right? Um, you know, you talk about it from more of a fulfilling needs perspective. Um, so the way you approach it has to be different. The other part about these is it's not just the product that you're talking about. It's understanding and training the reps to understand to use this product that pops up in, in the Proton AI software as a way to understand more about the business, right? So it's, yes, I'm talking about a specific product, but tell me again, you know, what are you using this product for, you know, in your business? So it's still a sales tool from a training perspective. It's not just all about selling that product that happens to pop up. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and you have to know how to do either, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think from a training perspective, you know, you would approach your CSRs a little bit differently in terms of how you might do this versus how you can really leverage it with more of a proactive inside sales team. We had another comment from Jason, uh, a fount of good insight and comments. He says, AI can also be even more impactful when you have good customer segmentation data. Having the ability to target the AI recommendations by customer makes the recommendations even more relevant. So I'm gonna, I wanna address the first part of that, which is yes, the, the recommendations have to be specific. Um, and, that's, and that's where AI can be helpful. Um, but the other part in that is about the segmentation. And I've, I've seen kind of two things with, with cross-sell software. One is that the AI can actually figure out the segmentation, right? So I, I spent a lot of my life in SIC codes and NAICS codes and, and that whole world and, um, and, and customer-defined segmentation or distributor-defined segmentation. That stuff can be helpful, but if you've got the right AI software, it'll actually often figure out what the segmentation is in a way that was perhaps unintuitive to you. So, and then he, he concludes by saying it's easier, it's also easier to do at scale with a reasonably sized team. If the AI product doesn't 
you buy doesn't drive the results you want. It may be that you have the wrong AI tool, not that AI doesn't work. And that's 100%. Yeah, it's all based on the data. I had a friend who's an engineer who told me he didn't believe in AI because his Nest thermostat could never get the temperature right in his house. And I said, <laughs> That would really like, suck. Do, I mean, you know, that, would, that would be a painful experience. But but I mean, you think about how many data points does a Nest thermostat have? It's got a few a day, right? So that's not much to learn from versus tens of thousands of transactions. And But I do think, look, I mean, you know, your ability to target does depend a lot on what you know about customers. And as always in modern marketing, it's the intersection of customer data and product data that drives great offer presentation, whether that's over the phone, it's online, it's SEO, you name it. In direct marketing, it's the intersection of customer and product data that drives relevant offers in front of targeted customers. And uh, now, you know, Proton uh, is only one of these systems. I'm sure there are others. I don't, that's the one that we've run into or use the most. Uh, but the data that they get is actually in the ERPs of the distributors, right? So mm -hmm. are there ways you can just use ERP data without having to go buy a different software system uh, to, I don't know, calculate your own correlations or to present information in front of customer service people or to give them printed report. I don't know. I don't know. How do you, how do you, can you leverage ERP data without having to go install the new software package to do it? And this, this is actually one of the things that we do um, as part of the projects that I work on is, you know, it's part of what you look for. You know, you, you have to kind of understand what products are, are the customers purchasing today you know, to understand, gives you a little bit of insight maybe into what kind of business they are. It's kind of all part of your pre-call planning, mm -hmm. you know, is to kind of always look there to see, you know, past order history and issues that might be happening, that type of thing. Um, so you definitely would use that. Um, but again, it's not, you know, it's not as good as it's having something pushed to you. You know, it's easy to overlook stuff. Some ERP systems are, um, kind of difficult to use, difficult to, to look at. Um, so I think that the software approach that we were talking about earlier is just easier because it's pushing the data to you. Not to say that you absolutely have to have it. Um, and in a proactive situation, like a proactive inside sales where you can prepare for a call, right? you, know, you can look at this data, it, it is somewhat helpful. But again, if you're a reactive person, you know, you're not really going to have the time or the preparation to know, oh, yeah, you bought this product, you know, a month ago. It looks like you probably need to buy it again. I don't know where you get that, how you would get that information without really looking into the ERP system. I wonder, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, so, so the ERP data is an input. I, it's not, it, it's where it's it's where you start. It's not where you end. And so the ERP data, and typically if you have it, PIM data, are the, are the key inputs to any kind of cross-sell software. So, um, so let, let me be devil's advocate for a second, I, I, or maybe you guys agree, I don't know. Couldn't you calculate your own correlations between items that tend to sell together? I mean, if I took my SKUs that made up, I don't know, 90% of my sales and put them in a spreadsheet and put in transaction history, couldn't I say, well, the most common item sold with SKU A is SKU B, and build a table and present that, you know, put that into the ERP so that if you buy SKU A, there's a field to the right that says offer SKU B. I mean, you're sort of building your own data set. I'm not saying it's as elegant or as powerful as Proton AI, but it feels like you could get this started on your own, but I don't know how hard that would be. I mean, what do you guys think? Is that doable? You, you could definitely get something that does recommendations. Mm -hmm. that, that makes recommendations. There's no question. Um, right. the, what, what you get with a system is you get hopefully better results, hopefully something that makes better recommendations as measured right. in you know, lift, sales lift. Um, you also get a system for managing all of this stuff. So yeah, you could definitely build this. And as you know, Ian, we've, we've built some of the software, but the, the yeah. broader mm -hmm. system that integrates all of this, the stuff that does the training, the stuff that does the learning, uh, I think that's the power that you get when you when you use an off-the-shelf system as opposed to building your own. That being said, I mean, if you're, you know, Amazon has certainly built their own. They're not using off-the-shelf software and their stuff works really well. Um, between Amazon, 
you know, as you, as you go into some of the, the largest distributors, perhaps those companies are building their own because they have the propensity to do that. But for the vast majority of distributors, they don't have the resources, either dollars or uh, uh, human capital to pull this off and be successful. So here's a specific question from our good friend Joe, also a regular listener. We are embarking on implementing a new ERP or at least a major upgrade. Do you have any insights on when you would start to play in the AI interface? Should this be reviewed at the outset or post-upgrade integration? An ERP is a major deal and expense in itself. Joe, we can talk about this further, um, but I would, what I would say is you, you could get something, the, the value in these systems is so great, meaning five to 10% sales lift for the people that are using them, that you should do an analysis and say, look, you know, is it worth doing an, a temporary integration to our existing ERP? Uh, because we know the, the, the current ERP implementation is gonna take another 12 months and the benefit we're gonna get from doing that is, is worthwhile. So I would, I would run those kind of break even analyses with assumptions about lift to determine whether you do it now and then reintegrate with your new ERP or um, whether the numbers suggest that you should wait until you get your new ERP. No, well, he's saying, should he do it simultaneously with his ERP upgrade or should he do the ERP upgrade and do the AI later? Yeah, I mean, you kind of, you, ha you have to have a target ERP that you're doing this with. No, I know, what he, but he's asking, we're gonna put a new ERP in should I go ahead and add AI to the scope of the new ERP or should I do the ERP and then do the, the AI recommender system later? How much does it add to the work and cost of an ERP implementation? It, it, I, I would say it depends, but from what we've seen, um, it's, it, it's, it, it would come down to the, the break even analysis that I just gave. You know, if, if the implementations take four to six weeks, most of the time is on the, the AI company, not the not the distributor. Right. So, um, so if you could get something implemented in six weeks, that, six to eight weeks, that didn't take a ton of time from your IT department, um, while you're still doing your, your new ERP, you, you might decide to to go ahead and do that, and then and then reconnect to your new ERP once you once you get that in place. Yeah, I, I mean, Joe, my answer would be talk to one of these companies like Proton AI. I don't think the integration or expense ad is very great. Um, and then we have a whole slew of input from Jason. Jason, I'm not going to be able to get to all of it. Just to say that um, uh, that a data set from a single distributor is fairly small, so it's hard to, distrib to, to, to distinguish between the signal and the noise, which may be an advantage of these external systems. Um, and uh, then we're going to wrap up here. I just want to point out that next week on the show, we will have Gregory Smith, who's the VP of Strategic Accounts and Partnerships with Sparks IQ, talking about how to implement a successful pricing initiative. So this is not a selling job for Sparks IQ. This is best practice information on how to design and implement a successful pricing initiative. So we'll hope, hope you'll join us for that. Uh, also, we are in the midst, actually, we're almost finished with a series, a seven-part series that we've done with NAW on how tech will transform the wholesale distribution industry. Uh, we have a webinar on, uh, on the 15th, which is the role of services. So we did a survey of a whole bunch of distributors about services and how they use them and how they plan them and how whether or not they're going to be able to monetize them directly, et cetera. And then I interviewed, gosh, I guess about 10 different distribution executives to get their input. Uh, so there's a lot of research data uh, from distributors uh, in that series. So we hope that you will join us for that. There's also a research re report that will come out um, in, again, in partnership with the NAW who helped us administer the survey. It's, it's really good data. You should see it. Our contact information is on the right. Uh, last question, Jonathan Debbie, if you had one tip for people who are trying to implement cross-selling and upselling in their current environment, what should they do first? Mm. I think what I would do first is think about where I would want to start and how I would want to start. So if I want to start with my CSRs as an example, because maybe a lot of transactions are going through that area or a reactive inside sales area, um, I would probably start with maybe a simple upsell initiative, um, you know, kind of introduce it that way and then slowly start to work in 
um, you know, more complementary products, maybe try and create, um, you know, some little data sets around what goes with what, you know, depending on what you have access to. But I might, you know, if, I'm, if I've never done it before and I'm just starting from scratch, that's probably how I would start. Excellent. Jonathan? Yeah, and I would add a, a third point to that of where you might start, which is, which is online, right? So I, th I think pick the right touch point and figure out what kind of a, a lift you might be able to get, um, make a business case for it, and then start to look at different solutions that will hopefully get you to that business, uh, that business break even or that, that ROI. Great, great. great. All right. Great. Good answers. Thanks so much, Jonathan, Debbie. Wonderful working with you as always. Thank you to the audience. Thanks for all the input. We had a tremendous amount of uh, questions today. We really benefited from that. And so did our listeners. Please join us next week on Wholesale Change. And in the meantime, have a great week and stay safe out there. Bye now.